Hey everybody, this is Brian Beeler with storagereview.com. We've got an interesting look today at the Asegra uh, FreeNAS plugin for backup and recovery. We recently did a, uh, a deep dive with Tom Fenton on our team around the Asegra integration with IX Systems uh, hardware and the FreeNAS uh, uh, operating environment. And so what we want to do is, for those that are more visual, is take a deeper dive into some of the screens and capabilities of the system. So Tom joins me today. Tom, welcome in. Hey, good afternoon. And also Jigen from Asegra, who's going to be doing the driving. So Jigen, thanks for joining us today as well. Very welcome. Hi, Brian. So, so Tom, you did uh, a lot of the hands-on work with this system and, and explored the capabilities and and uh, you know, work through a lot of the, the technical uh, pieces and you're a longtime FreeNAS user. So out of the gate, you know, what, what was your takeaway on uh, the Asegra plugin? Yeah, you know, this kind of came on, on my radar screen on that uh, little write-up you guys did announcing it first. And I was kind of excited to see it because you know, FreeNAS is just one of those things that I think everyone has somewhere. You know, my implementation's been just sitting in my garage just running for years and years. It's just rock solid. And I was really excited to see that, you know, that we have a backup solution that utilizes that that underlying, um, you know, FreeNAS, TrueNAS uh, environment. Because like I said, it's rock solid. Um, and then on top of that with the Segra giving away the 10 licenses for um, backup use, it really kind of caught my eye. Well, yeah, especially for Home Lab. I mean, this is a, a, a great platform to play around with. I'll tell you, no one asked me, but I'll tell you what my favorite part is, is this that we're looking at, the, that it's got a, a great uh, GUI dashboard because I am not a CLA, CLI kind of guy. And, and I know, and we'll get into it, there are some older Java-based components, but this new look and feel on the HTML5 is is pretty slick. Jigen, what's what's going on here on the dashboard that you guys are proud of? Yeah, on the dashboard here, we can, we can see a component summary. So basically all the components that are being uh, managed and monitored by the, uh, uh, the, the MSP or the end customer uh, will, will be uh, displayed on this screen. So the DS systems, which is the data repository, um, um, that would receive the backup data from all the DS clients. Essentially, DS clients are the uh, data collectors deployed at the uh, uh, location of all the source machines that need to be backed up. And these DS, DS clients will be uh, sending the data from the source site to the DS system, which is uh, the service that's running on the Furnessa appliances. So essentially, we have a, a view of all the activities, errors, warnings, and so on on this uh, dashboard. Yeah, yeah it was Tom wrong. Yeah, what, what do you got, Tom? Oh yeah, I was gonna say I was I was also really impressed with the GUI. Um, you know, doing backups by command line just it's just right for, for for typos to 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 really mess you up. So I was real happy to to see this GUI as well. Yeah. So one of the things in our environment. So this is uh, this is Jigen's test bed. Ours is is still upright, but um, doesn't have quite as much activity on the screens. One of the things that also stood out to me was the uh, the error summary and reporting over on the right side of the screen. Jigen, what's the uh, what's the deal with the error you've got there? Is that a critical thing? What what sort of visualization do you have on the errors? Uh, the, essentially, the uh, uh, backups that did not run or ran with uh, warnings or or specific errors will be displayed on on uh, this screen here. We can click on the see all button, which will uh, bring us to the um, uh, event logs as well as the activity logs screen. And from here, we can um, um, drill down and into the event log itself to find out the exact type of errors. For example, um, this specific error on this backup set uh, was related to a backup set that was stopped uh, because it failed to connect to the backup source. So most likely the, um, the, there was no path to the, uh, to the machine on the network. Maybe the machine was down or turned off. And that's the reason why this uh, specific error uh, popped up on this uh, dashboard. Yeah, talking about the sources, you guys can use just about anything as a source. Can you go over some of those uh, sources real quick? We can back up pretty much any type of source out there, whether it is Office 365, G Suite, Salesforce, or application servers, web servers, um, Exchange, SharePoint, all that is supported as well. So pretty much any type of application that uh, we have support for via APIs to be able to gain access to the uh, data within um, th these uh, machines, we can back them up. Okay, so that's whether it's in the cloud or on-premise, right? That's correct. 
Yeah, so you can have laptops, you can have, th th this is pretty much a, a, a single source backup solution. You don't need different ones for your, your desktop machines or your Salesforce, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah th I think that's another huge benefit of this. Yeah, so. Salesforce is one we don't see a whole lot. Like Office 365 is starting to get pretty common for backup products, but Salesforce, I think, is, is somewhat unique. And actually, we run on Google Suite here, so I know there's a, a lot of places that haven't really addressed G Suite either, that really Office 365 was the, the number one, and then maybe it's just a slow rollout from there. But Salesforce and G Suite are pretty cool. Yeah, so when you, when you do these things, do you need to put an agent in each one of the each one of those sources or nope we're a fully fully agentless uh, solution yes so essentially uh, we can back up pretty much all the all of these sources that i mentioned before agentlessly uh, with uh, whether it's office 365 sharepoint exchange again the idea is to be able to um, provide the uh, machine name or the ip address of the machine on the LAN, and then the credentials for that machine to be able to gain access to the machine's um, data agentlessly uh, so essentially, um, on the network, we will be deploying a single uh, deployment of the agentless DS client. And on that DS client, we will be creating backup sets, schedules, retention rules, and so on uh, to be able to connect to the machines uh, on the network agentlessly to be able to gain access to the uh, data that needs to be backed up. Okay. Can you do that securely? So you... Of course. Um, uh, again, all the backup um, um, uh, data that's been collected will, of course, be encrypted with uh, uh, 256-bit encryption key. Uh, there are two levels of encryption that we use uh, at AES 256-bit. An account encryption key as well as a private encryption key will have to be set during the deployment of the DS client. And these keys are used to encrypt the customer data uh, before the data is sent uh, to the uh, DS system, uh, which is the backup repository. All right. What, what about uh, dedupe and things like that, uh, data efficiency? Yeah, we uh, we have a duplication at the block level. So, for example, if uh, a customer's uh, a document file changes and let's say the customer adds an extra paragraph um, to the uh, document file, uh, only that paragraph will be will be will be sent to the uh, DS system for backup. And of course, if there are multiple files that are this, uh, that are similar, we'll be able to also dedupe uh, at the file level as well as block level. So Windows files, Office files that are common, all of these files will not be backed up more than once to the DS system repository. Yeah. So what kind of uh, compression ratio or deduplication ratio are you seeing out there in the wild? Typically, I would say three to one or better. So again, the more data you back, you, you back up, uh, the, the better the ratio the ratio would get. So typically, we go with three to one ratios or four to one ratios. All right. Um, do you have something you can show us, just either a backup restore, kind of how to use the GUI? Sure. If we go to the data management tab, that's why we'll, we'll be creating backup sets, managing backup sets, and so on. Let me just refresh the page here. Yeah, and incidentally, while you're pulling that up, I I neglected to to, uh, to mention that uh, you know one of my favorite things about it, besides having a GUI, is that this is just part of the plugins uh, uh, option that's embedded within FreeNAS. So there's a um, a capability there to just click it and go, which is a lot easier than, not that it's impossible to go grab a package and install it and that sort of thing, but I think that the fact that it's natively there is uh, is pretty slick. Right, when um, we installed this in the lab, we found it pretty frictionless to, to get up and going. Yeah, which is actually sometimes a knock <laughs> against FreeNAS because it's, it's so flexible that there's a ton of knobs and dials and sometimes that can be intimidating so the click and go is is a nice touch i think yeah right just like that i've created a uh, um I've, I've gone to the backup set uh, creation screen and i was able to create a backup set for office 365 so essentially this is a domain with about 437 exchange uh, accounts and also SharePoint and OneDrive. So we support pretty much backup of uh, all of these um, um, Office 365 data contents there online. And we'll be able to also filter. And um, um, for example, maybe you like to only back up the inbox or send type items, for example, you can just select those. Or if you don't you filter down, you can basically select uh, uh, to back up all the data within the uh, uh, Office 365 domain. Um, it's the same way we can create a backup so for pretty much any type of uh, source there so uh, that is supported. Uh, for example, um, you know, file system, uh, SQL Server, Exchange, SharePoint, Hyper-V, VMware, all from this uh, single pane of glass interface. Okay. And I, I know that you know, the European has certain rules about um, being able to delete 
uh, delete you, yourself from from the internet, basically. Do you guys right, forget me, right? Yeah, forget me. Yeah, what, what, the, what's your story there? Yeah, the right to be forgotten. Uh, essentially, um, we can generate a GDPR certificate that shows um, the customer uh, kind of a proof on all the files that have been removed from the DS system storage, the data repository. Essentially, um, the files will be listed um, on this uh, certificate um, showing the deletion type as well as who uh, made the deletion as, as well as when the, when the files, uh, files were removed. Um, this can be generated for all data that has been removed from the DS system over the last 30 days. And of course, uh, we also um, can self-brand as well. Uh, this uh, certificate can be rebranded um, with the with the uh, with the end customer's uh, own logos if required as well, and information if required. Right. So, uh, if you'd like to um, select a specific uh, 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 item or backup set from this list, you can just search by backup set name. So, let's say I'm looking for a backup set that has test in the name. So you will essentially be able to only filter down and see just the backup sets with test in the name. You can click and to select the backup set. And then of course you can run a backup uh, by clicking this button, perform a recovery, as well as delete specific items within a backup set or edit the backup set. So you want to restore a file, click on the restore uh, backup button. Uh, no sessions on this one. Let me switch to another backup set. All right. And then the backup um, uh, data will be listed within this within the GUI. You can select um, the file to be restored. For example, this specific I, I had created a um, a test file for uh, my virus um, um, uh, scan testing. Uh, Asigra does uh, scans for viruses and malware as well during backup and recovery. So I was doing a quick test on that, and I have this backup set that has a a, a text file with a with a fake virus in it. So I'm able to recover this file um, again. If you if this file was backed up multiple multiple times and there are many generations, we could always click on the uh, uh, magnifying glass um, uh, up here to be able to select a specific generation within within that um, uh, within the backup session and then of course we can um, uh, select the file and then recover the file to the um, original location or an alternate location somewhere else on another machine maybe locally to the ds client machine or maybe another machine on the network we can do that as well okay and you can set up different roles for different uh, users that's correct yes we have role-based access if i go into the um, um, settings tab here we can go into users and permissions and we can create different user accounts who have um, you know specific uh, um, individuals can have access to a specific DS client or DS system and be able to manage their own environment yeah there's quite a bit of depth there and we don't have to go through all of it but I know that uh, the Jigen gets really excited about the uh, policy driven uh, approach for retention uh, there's a ton of uh, options there too that are that are kind of interesting. The scheduling and retention uh, are near and dear to Jigen's heart. Yeah, so under retention rules, um, I can quickly show you how comprehensive our retention rules are. Um, we can essentially create uh, uh, retention rules and schedules at the DS client level. Um, so if I drill down to the DS client that we're going to be managing right now, I can create a uh, retention rule under that DS client. Let's say we'd like to create a 10-year retention rule, for example. Again, uh, we support um, um, GFS type of functionality. So essentially, we can keep um, you know copies of a file if the file changes. Um, so essentially, the, the, the files we kept for, you know on a daily basis. We can have you know seven daily copies, four weekly copies, 12 monthly copies, uh, as well as um, 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 yearly generations as well. So from this screen, I'm going to create, um, uh, first of all, I'm going to create uh, daily copies. So one keep one generation every day for the last week for seven daily copies. And then keep one generation every week. Again, we can also say every week on, a, on a, uh, you know, which specific day and time you like to keep that generation for the last uh, uh, month for four weeklies. And then one generation every um, uh, month for the last year and then of course one every year for the last 10 and so on so again this can be set up based on what the customer's preference is uh, they can they can go ahead and set up just maybe three months of retention or or, or 10 years of retention again if the storage is available uh, to keep all of these uh, these uh, different file versions um, they can go ahead go ahead and keep, keep those but the idea is to be able to uh, um, just keep the exact generation that would be required to be able to go back to a specific version when needed uh, when the when, when the, the customer is doing restores for example and if I go into the schedules section we can create schedules um, 
for uh, at the again at the backup set uh, um, at the DS client level, and we can create um, you know daily, weekly schedules and so on. And our schedules can go all the way down to um, um, the frequency of every I think every minute. Uh, that's a, that's the lowest we can go. Well, let's assume a backup set can complete within uh, let's say five minutes. We can run a backup every five minutes um, on a daily basis, for example, as well as set up tasks right after a backup uh, set has uh, has completed its operation. So we could also enforce a retention right after a backup um, has completed. Now, in the future, we also have um, <clears throat> features like uh, scheduled restores coming as well. So currently we have scheduled backups, but soon we'll be, ha we'll be um, uh, uh, releasing uh, the uh, version 14.2, which will have support for scheduled restores. Um, essentially, you'll we'll, we'll be able to restore files and <clears throat> virtual machines, um, you know, every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, so that it's, you know, those machines can be on standby uh, in case the production one goes down. Yeah. I mean, you, you also kind of scan the data that's at rest using your TAC loop to make sure that, that it's, it's not infected, right? That's correct. We have a cybersecurity um, um, a tool that can be enabled for backup activities as well as restore activities. It's called the attack loop prevention uh, feature. The reason why we call it the attack loop prevention feature is because let's say you know um, there's a malware that has some type of a time bomb functionality. Let's say it detonates every three months. It will um, so and it let's say it has encrypted your environment um, on day one. Then you go well. We have backups. Let's perform a recovery. You may inadvertently recover the malware back into the production environment. And then, of course, three months later, the, de the malware detonates again, and then um, um, the whole environment is encrypted. So you go into this loop of recovering and, and, and then getting encrypted over and over again. So this is what we prevent. That's why we call it the attack loop prevention feature, because we would also scan the files that are being recovered back into the production environment. If the files are detected to be malware, we will move any file that is malware into a quarantine location in zipped password protected format. This way, we will we essentially are preventing this attack loop from occurring. Yeah, that's that's huge. You know, like especially when you talk about things that are time bombed. What good's doing a restore if you're just restoring something that's already been infected? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that is strong, and and I think um, you know, Chigan just hinted at uh, the updates that are coming in fourteen two. The uh, the other thing that's worth noting here is that. Asegra is pretty quickly iterating on point releases to continue to flesh out the uh, operational uh, feature set within this uh, this new interface for for FreeNAS. So it's a, a pretty quick cycle on uh, on rolling through updates there. So that's another uh, useful point. And another thing that I found interesting about the company Asegra is I, I just didn't realize they've been around for what thirty five years. And so they're taking all this tribal knowledge, all this information they've they've gathered, and they're you know they're they're putting it in a nice, easy to consume product. Yeah, overall, we uh, we found it to be pretty strong in our lab. I think uh, a lot of guys will like this that uh, you know are either tinkering or running small environments. Uh, service providers have a have a whole interface available to them from a Segra too if they're managing multiple clients. I mean, this touches so many things and. And uh, the fact, like I said, that it's uh, within the, the plugins menu on the, uh, the base install of FreeNAS is pretty strong too. So, hey, thanks guys for, uh, for walking through this. Uh, for those that are a little more visual and don't want to read our content, that's fine. We'll make you videos all day long. So, you know, G Jigen, thanks for joining in. Tom, thanks for your perspective. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for checking out the video. Hey, thanks guys. Yeah, thanks everyone.